What is up, everybody? Good evening if you're on the East Coast or good afternoon if you're in New Zealand like Ryan. I'm Adrian M. Gibson, and welcome to the final event of TBRCon 2023 Day 7, where I'm going to be doing an author reading with Ryan Cahill. How are you, my friend? And you're actually going to be doing the reading. Surprise! Really? Ha ha! <laughs> <laughs> How are you, buddy? Yeah, I'm, you know, considering I haven't had much sleep and I was up at 4 a.m. for the last panel, I'm actually doing pretty good. Yeah, and I highly recommend everyone go yeah. check that out. That was a the, fantastic panel. Uh, the Modern Epic Fantasy panel with uh, Ryan and Ken Liu and uh, R.R. Vierdi, Justin T. Call, and Bookborn, which was very invigorating. And Ryan had a lot of energy for being up so early in the morning. I always <laughs> do. It's an issue that I have full of energy man all the time but i actually have to take caffeine to calm myself down which is you know an interesting <laughs> paradox i don't know how that works but sure I, it's it's a weird thing i don't know caffeine makes me sleepy i think a lot of people who have like adhd and stuff like really get that it's like um it's something to do with it being a stimulant and it kind of has a reverse effect it's one of the kind of the markers of adhd and um, mm -hmm. i have no idea if that's definitely me but it definitely slows me down <laughs> Well, that works because you've been working like yeah. a maniac and now of war and ruin which is ryan's new book i've got some graphics that i'll show up on the screen with that beautiful cover it's You're been out so for professional. dude i know man that's just what i gotta i gotta i gotta bring my professionalism to every avenue of the things that i do but uh how are you feeling weirdly, after weirdly sexual <laughs> <laughs> to everything I do. <laughs> Rawr. Rawr. Um, the book's been out for, <clears throat> man, my voice is cracking up because you got me all hot and bothered. Uh, the book's been True. out for a little over a week. How are you feeling? Yeah, really good. Really good. It's um, It's been weird. It's been really cool. Um, I just, yeah, it, it, I think anytime something happens, it's really strange for me to process it. Like even with the broken binding and, and the website crashing when people were searching for it and um only like a few minutes before it went live like the hardback pre-order went live i was talking to matt everyone's a broken binding mm -hmm. and i was texting him saying oh dude i think we need to like lower our expectations for this launch because you know i haven't really been able to promote it as much and then you you've been really busy too like i think we just need to you know i don't know how it's going to go and then i clicked on the the refresh button for the website for the page and it wouldn't load and then I went to the search bar and I was like, fucking, come on. And then it's like, there's too much traffic. And then Matt calls me and he's like, mate, you broke the fucking website. And uh, I was like, fuck, how cool is that? That's awesome. He's like, no, it's yeah, not cool. Is... You broke the fucking website. People are trying to buy the book. I was like, yeah, but let me have my freak out moment. Yeah. I think it's a cool, I think it's a cool thing to be proud of that you broke yeah, a website. It's... Yeah. What was really, what was really weird is um, like 60 seconds after the sale went live, one of the numbered books was on eBay for like 75 pound or something and it sold. Wow. Um, which is really fucking sneaky, weird. Sneaky bastards. Really sneaky bastards. Because I think you you told me that you and Matt purposefully kind of went into it to make it like an approachable special edition. I think it was like 55 pounds. Oh, this isn't even like a special that. edition. This was this was the, the normal edition for this. Oh, just book. the normal one. Just oh, the dude. normal. Yeah. So we do. I do 50 oh, wow. numbered. I've always done 50 numbered and... It was, it's really funny looking back like at the numbered editions at the start and like a special edition now, a special edition with 1500 numbered copies and this one only with 50. And mm. so they go really, really quick and a few spilled over and they were gone inside seconds when the launch happened and then one was up on eBay immediately. Wow. We're, we're, kind, we're kind of worried what the resale market will be like for the, the special edition mm -hmm. because yeah, we did. We went to pains to make sure that it was as affordable as possible while still making it feasible for us to actually do. Right. Um, which is why like 55 pounds is a lot of money, but compared to you know, some of the other companies that are producing that level of special edition, they're standardly 150 pounds. Yeah. Um, so we were really happy with that, but we're really worried what the the resale market might be. Well, but Matt must have to deal with that crap all the time with all the special editions that he produces. Yeah. 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 It, it's it, part of it. Like, and I, I, I never mind seeing stuff like that, but it's just when there's people who can't afford to, to get the book it's a bit shit like because i want to, I, we wanted to make it for for the readers like so that's yeah. a bit shit when someone has to part with crazy money for one mm -hmm. yeah well i think it's it, it's something that i've seen across like various markets you know like i was a music journalist back in university and i would see it all the time with ticket sales like concert tickets <sighs> and you've probably seen this too it's just like really oh, yeah. horrible i haven't been to a concert in a really long time 
but it was just shit. Like it was really terrible. For, <laughs> like for me, you know, from my perspective, it was, it was like it was shit. Yeah, yeah. I, I was I was reviewing concerts and and uh, interviewing musicians and stuff like that, and the musicians would complain about it. You know, because it's like fucking scalpers out in the front, or you know, uh, Craigslist, which is like a uh, a website in North America where you can yeah. sell anything from like concert tickets to like rent out an apartment or like proposition people for like yeah I was, I was like where's sex. it going with this one they're like yeah yeah <laughs> oh it goes into weird dark places like craigslist is a how, is a strange how long have you spent on place. craigslist i haven't been i haven't lived in canada i'm, in like I'm not i'm not judging you so. i'm just asking i could you know a guy got a guy gotta get his mushroom somewhere just a side hobby man you know just hang okay, out on there and see what's up yeah it's okay <laughs> this is this is the weirdest interview i think i've had at least the weirdest first six minutes yeah um it's a yeah, remix, like so it. don't worry about it's it. It's cool. Man. Yeah. Yeah, it's fine. The numbers are actually yeah. going up of the people that are watching, so that's a good sign. Cool team. <laughs> yes. Also, Shad Zaman is in the is in the chat saying uh, they've read 400 pages of War and Ruin, and they're loving it so far. Ah, and, amazing. Uh, yeah. So thank you for reading the book. It, it, it's, it's a weird it's a weird one because I was only talking to someone the other day and like it's 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 my best rated book that I've released so far and it, it's been doing really well. But I know there's one or two people who like have loved the series up to now and then it didn't land with them quite as well. And it's really strange for me because like it's 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 like a sad feeling. You feel like you've let a reader down. You're like, Yeah, oh no. Like you're never like you're not like, oh, how dare you not love my book? It's like, oh crap. I'm sorry. Yeah. So like anytime like, I hear what, someone's having a what, great day, it's, it's fantastic. Oh, yeah. but like, it's gonna happen. It's gonna happen. There's always yeah. been people who, and I think reading is like one of those things that it's one of the one of the things that your mood, your atmosphere, your time, and the context and the situation affect how you, affect how you read something so much. Yeah. Like I've had books where I've picked them up and I've like put them down inside like a hundred pages, and then it took two years later I come back to it and love it. Mm-hmm. Like so, it's it's one of those. But it's it's uh, anytime someone tells me, I think launching a new book is so nerve wracking, especially because yeah. with all of mine, something drastic has changed. So. Like from book one to book two, we had way more POVs. And then from book two to book three, it's way longer. And each POV has like a far more developed and complex storyline. So I get nervous. Mm. I release it. I'm like, please let people not hate it. That would be great. <laughs> um, please don't hate it. And then so, yeah, whenever I'm, so every time someone's having a good time, I'm having a good time. Yeah. Well, uh, Devin Springer in the chat finished the book last night and called it epic. So, you know. We're... Thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. Oh, there. And Shaggy Shepard's here. Late. But you're oh, here. Shaggy's That's one of my favorites. Matters. Yeah. And uh, Joe Rixman's asking, um, let me just check this real quick. Uh, they're curious which chapter you'll be reading from today. So if you want to tell people a little bit about the book, because we've just been shooting the shit. We haven't even said anything yeah. about it. Oh, we no. haven't talked about the book. Who, well, we're not here for the book, really, are we? We're here, we're yeah. here for dick jokes. That is why we're here. Okay. <laughs> That's all we're here um, for. Yeah, tell I'm, them a bit about the book. Read- yeah, I'm probably just going to read from the prologue. So I'm going to read from A War and Ruin, which is the third book in my epic fantasy series, The Man of the Broken. Um, this book is a long book, but I've tried to make it that everything matters and every every little piece, every little detail that kind of happens will come back up. Um, at least that's what I try and do. But um, I think most people who are here probably know a little bit about my books either way. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was going to read maybe from like a different chapter, but I feel like I don't want to spoil anything in the book. Mm-hmm. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with the prologue. I always find readings weird. So I'm probably gonna what's gonna happen is my brain is gonna naturally tweak into like that received pronunciation English accent. My parents are gonna ask me why I'm reading in an English accent. Um, my friends are naturally <laughs> gonna be annoyed at me because I'm Irish. And then at, at times it's gonna get weird, but we're gonna get through it together. Yeah, yeah. I and then uh, Shag, Shaggy's Shaggy's always here for Bolina jokes. So you know, you know. This is what it I is. Think, I, th- I think we're going to be fine. Yeah. Like she's not actually in this chapter, <laughs> but like I, I love Belina. She's one of my favorites to write. And she has all the, all the dick jokes, all the other jokes. And she's kind of one of the only characters, I think, who can make those jokes without a feeling anachronistic, which is uh, pretty yeah. fun for me. Yeah, man. All right. Well, uh, I will Woo. let you take it away. But, you know, nobody in the chat, don't judge Ryan as his voice shifts. Oh, definitely right. judge me. Trust me, like, I'm gonna, this is like, this is like <laughs> weird, right? So like I've gotten to places where I do like, like play music, right? And I go on gigs and if you like, I've done it with like seven, 800 people there, a few thousand people there. And I get a little bit nervous and then it's fine. 
But when I'm doing these readings, I shit myself. I'm like, my heart's just going. It's like, I wrote the book. Why the hell am I nervous just reading it? Right. That's Doesn't make good. sense. Shaggy's going to judge you. I don't know who else will. but uh... She always judges. She's judgy. But she's lovely. It's okay. Yeah. Lovely yeah. and judgy. They go together. We, we love you, Ryan. It's okay. I'll let you, I'll let you take it away. Okay, buddy? unfortunately okay oh no on my own now this isn't what's meant to happen okay let me prep so i kind of have oop i'm gonna burp this isn't what adrian thought was gonna happen it feels weird when i'm on my own i'm gonna keep talking to myself and the timer is just gonna keep rolling so what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna read from the prologue and then we're probably gonna get i'd say hopefully we'll get to the end of the prologue it's not too long and then we're gonna go to q a all right <clears throat> And I'm going to get a weird accent at the start. So, like I said, don't judge me too harshly. Captain Tira. Okay. Captain Tira Linav. No, it's too weird. I get weird. I'm going to try an Irish accent. It just feels weird to me. Captain Tira Linar folded her arms, dragging a lungful of frost-touched air in through her nostrils. Even armored in her full plate, she felt the sharp bite of the storm winds moving inland from the lightning coast. Above her, clouds of obsidian black blanketed the sky, blocking out all but a few stray strands of pale moonlight. Shadows flickered along the battlements, soldiers moving about in the dim glow of the lanterns that hung from poles. Easterlock was ringed by two walls, each fronted by a spike-filled trench that sank 30 feet into the ground. The city's walls were manned night and day, always ready, always waiting. The elves rarely strayed from the cover of Lanalian, and only ever in small numbers. But Easterlock was the first line to hold back the tide, should that ever change. A dense layer of fog coated the land before the city's outer walls. Tendrils of grey smoking over the river Hurin, creeping ever closer to the city. The river was almost 600 feet wide, running from the mountains of Mardaru and outward into the Valoran Ocean. No bridges traversed the river, no fixed points of crossing. It wasn't meant to be crossed. On the other side of the river, the immense woodland of the Nalian rose through the thick fog, each tree climbing hundreds of feet, their branches sweeping outward, thick with leaves of dark green. The woodland was as vast as an ocean, stretching over a thousand miles around the foothills of Mardaru, hugging the coastline on the other side. It never gets easier, does it? Weird accent. Tira turned at the sound of the familiar voice, nodding to Gallo as the man ascended from the shadow-covered stairs and stepped into the light of the lantern that hung on a pole to Tira's left. Gallo was no taller than her, with a thick beard of black, stipled with white and a helm strapped firmly under his chin. He wore a steel breastplate emblazoned with the black lion of Loria, a sword at his left hip. He too was a captain of the guard, though he was ten years Tira's senior. He had been a captain when she had first arrived at Easterlock. She would only seen eighteen summers then. Not when you never get any younger, old man. You've come from the inner wall? Gallo nodded, casting his gaze out as the oozing layer of fog that crept across the ground before the city walls. Aye, tis quieter than a funeral. I left Doris in charge. Thought you'd appreciate the company. How goes the watch? Before Tira could answer, a shiver ran the length of her spine, a faint sound touching her ears, like a whistle in the wind. She tilted her head sideways. Did you hear that? Hear what? Gallo asked, raising an eyebrow. Um, I'm not sure. Something. Tira unfolded her arms, stepping closer to the battlements and narrowing her gaze as she studied the creeping fog. She looked along the ramparts. Lanterns illuminated the length of the wall, spots of warm orange light stretching off into the distance until they were nothing but dim flecks, partly obscured by the silhouettes of the soldiers who huddled around them. The knight's playing tricks on you, Tira. Gallo laughed, clasping his hand on her shoulder. Maybe. Tira continued to stare along the ramparts as she spoke, not bothering to shrug away Gallo's hand. It's what this place does, Gallo said, 
leaning against the battlement, staring out at an alien in the distance. Here. Gallo produced a small metal flask from within his cloak, taking a swig before passing it to Tira. Something to warm the body and soothe the mind. Tira took the flask, raised the opening to her nose. The smell of the sharp spirit burned her nostrils. She knew the noxious liquid would do little to soothe her mind, but she would take every drop of warmth she could find. Lifting the flask to her lips, she took a long draught, relishing the burn as the spirit slid down her throat. She tilted her head back and let it a long sigh, watching her breath mist in the air. That stuff isn't cheap, you know, Gallo said, laughing. He snatched the flask out of Tira's hand, took another swig and slid it back into his coat. I know, Tira said, smiling. That's why I drink yours. Tira's voice trailed off, the hair on her arms and neck standing on end as she saw one of the lanterns go out further along the wall. Her heart stopped. Had she just seen that, or was the knight truly playing tricks on her? What is it? Gallo asked, following her gaze into the distance. A sense of urgency picked up in his voice. What are you looking at? As though in direct response to Gallo's question, another light went out. Another lantern snuffed. Then another. And another. Did that just... We need to sound the alarm! Tira yelled, pulling at the horn that hung around her neck. Tira, hold on. We need to... Tira whipped her head around at the sudden stop in Gallo's words. She found herself staring at her friend's eyes as they bulged. Gallo's hands were clasped either side of his throat, his fingers wrapped around the shaft of an arrow that had punched through his neck from the right to left. He stood there for a moment, surprise painting his face, blood pouring over his fumbling fingers, his lips moving but no sound escaping his throat. <laughs> then he stumbled sideways, the surprise in his eyes supplanted by fear before they rolled to the back of his head and he fell from the ramparts. Dread slithered through Tira's veins, her blood turning to ice as she watched her friend fall into the darkness. She staggered, resting her head, her hand against the battlements, steadying herself. Taking in a deep breath, she pulled the horn to her lips and blew as hard as her panic lungs would allow. A chorus of horns answered her call. After a few moments, the deep, Sonorous ringing of the city bells echoed through the night, joined by the sound of armoured boots as the city's garrison mobilised. Thousands of soldiers emptied out into the streets, reacting to the alarm with an efficiency bred from repetition and time, flooding the ramparts of both the inner and outer walls. Shouts and screams rang out all along the walls, lanterns going dark, soldiers plummeting to their deaths. Her mouth going dry, Tira pushed herself away from the battlements, Standing to her full height, the soldiers swarmed around her, bows gripped in their fists, swords at their hips, taking up their positions. It took Tira a moment to gather herself, pushing the images of Gallo from her mind. She cast her gaze over the flickering mass of torches that now filled the city and illuminated both the inner and outer walls. Steady, a voice called in the night. Hold your positions. Tira turned to see a tall man marching towards her. He had a face that looked as though it had been chiseled from rock and a long black cloak with silver markings billowed behind him as he moved. Captain Lina, report. What's happening? Exarch Dragcare. Tira inclined her head as, as was proper, shifting so some of the soldiers could take her positions along the wall. I spit it out, Captain. I, I don't know, Exarch. Everything was quiet and then we've taken casualties from arrows, but visibility is too low to tell how many. The exarch narrowed his eyes, held Tira's gaze for a moment, then nodded. Not arrows! Dradkin strode over to the battlements, his eyes fixed on the fog-covered ground below. Tira didn't have to look to know that more battle mages had taken a position along the length of the wall. Orbs of light burst into existence across the landscape at the base of the walls, floating off the ground, slicing through thick fog, illuminating the night. Tira's heart hammered against her ribs. Within moments, every inch of ground within a hundred feet of the city walls would bathe in white light as though it was midday. But there was nothing to be seen. No attackers, no army, only damp grass and shrubs. The echoing clang of city bells pierced the heavy silence. But after a few moments, even the bells faded. The garrison was roused. The people sheltered. Exarch Dradkir looked to Tira 
but she was as perplexed as anyone else. She'd seen the arrows. She'd seen Garrow fall to his death, blood spurting from his neck. She'd seen the lights go out. Exoc! Both Dragkir and Tira turned at the sound of the soldier's voice. It took a moment for Tira to realize what the man was pointing at, but then she saw it. On the ground below, standing at the edge of the orb's light, was an elf. It was nearly impossible to gauge the elf's size or build, but it wore a full suit of smooth flowing golden plate that glittered in the light of the orbs. A red cloak nodded at its shoulders. The elf had a teardrop shaped shield in its left hand that stretched from its neck to its knees, a long shafted battle axe in its right fist. What's it doing? One of the soldiers whispered. Waiting, Dradkir answered causing the soldier who had spoken to jolt upright, straighten his back and stare ahead. But the more prudent question is what is it waiting for? Dradkir stared at the elf for a moment, casting a cursory glance further along the ground. No other elves stood in the light. Tira had already checked. Should, should, should we wait? Tira asked, glancing towards Dradkir. Dradkir held Tira's gaze for a beat. Around him, the soldiers' erratic breaths misted into the air, their eyes fixed on the elf, their hands twitching on their bowstrings. This is not the time to wait and see, Captain Lenore. Draw and loose! The sounds of hundreds of arrows being loosed cut through the air, and Tira watched their flight, the light from the baldir on the ground below dispelling any shadows. Anticipation nodded in her gut. The hairs on the back of her neck pricked when she saw the arrows parting before the elf, splitting like water breaking against the bow of a ship. One after another, they plunged into the ground around the elf, leaving it unscathed and unmoved. Fear set like ice in her veins. She had witnessed the spark being used countless times. She'd grown up around it. She'd been trained around it. But it had only ever been the mages who had wielded its power. She had seen the battle mages rip holes through enemy lines. Healers set broken bones, crafts mages build bridges in minutes. But she'd never seen an enemy wield the power of the spark. She'd never had to face it in battle. As Tira's eyes remained fixed on the armored elf, arrows studding the ground around it, more elves stepped from the fog obscure darkness, their golden armor sparkling like stars in the white orb light. In a matter of moments, one became ten, became a hundred, became thousands. Tira swallowed hard, her throat tightening. A shiver swept through her, starting in her chest and moving through her arms and legs until even her fingers trembled. She could hear the shuffling of armoured feet around her, the mumbles and gasps. What are they waiting for? Tira whispered, more to herself than anyone else. But she saw Dradkir glance towards her, trepidation in her eyes. That worried her even more. She had never seen Dradkir so much as flinch. In fact, she'd never seen any battle mage show even the slightest hint of hesitancy. Whoosh! Tira's blood turned to ice. Whoosh! She had heard that sound before, many times. But she had never heard it come from behind enemy lines. The air felt heavy. The night was still. Nothing but breaths and wing beats. Then the world shook. A blood chilling roar ripped through the sky. Tira's heart plunged into her stomach, her limbs stiffening. The dark erupted with a series of blazing flashes as orange red fire poured over the ramparts, sweeping from east to west snuffing out hundreds of lives in the blink of an eye. It was only then Tira connected everything. Why the elves had feigned the first assault and why they had waited. They were drawing us out, pulling us onto the walls. All around her, soldiers scattered, screaming, shrieking, running for the stairs, knocking each other to their deaths. Tira stood rooted in place, her gaze fixed on the sky. There was no point in running. Two blazing orange eyes stared back at her, glistening in the light of the roaring fire as the great dragon plummeted, its jaws open wide. 
Wisps of flame formed in the creature's gaping maw, flickering. Taking a deep breath, Tira exhaled through her nose and closed her eyes. Haraya embraced me. And that's the end of the prologue, which I did mostly in an Irish accent, which felt weird. I uh, <laughs> I really appreciate your... <laughs> Jackie and I were talking about this. Your, your narration exploration, where you, <laughs> you were exploring different uh, accents, and it was really beautiful to see. But that was really good. So like, it, when I'm reading it to myself, like, say if I'm sitting here and I'm not on camera, the whole thing is kind of right. read like a, pronun a received pronunciation, like English accent, and yeah. I'll kind of like know the accents of what I'm doing. But for some reason, when I go to do it on like a camera, my brain just kind of shits itself. And it's like, <laughs> you know, just, just fucking throw random shit around. And it's actually the first time I've ever done a reading in like a predominantly Irish accent, which feels weird because yeah. I actually hate listening to Irish accents, like on TV and stuff. It, it's weird for me. No, it was good though. I really, I really enjoyed that. Uh, Go team! But it was, it was like, it was fun, you know, because I could see you, I could see you trying so hard. Oh and yeah, that kind of, that's you know, I, I need to get a medal for you know, just participation. <laughs> that is also Joe why you hire narrators. Exactly. Yeah. So Ryan is not a professional narrator. That's why you no. get like Travis Baldry. Despite what like that. you might think, you know, obviously you might, you might think I am now after hearing that amazing rendition, but, uh, but no. Yeah. Does anyone in the chat think that Ryan should be a professional narrator? If anyone says yes, they are lying. Well, Bo Kelly said you did a great job. Joe Rixman uh, said, I'd forgotten just how intense that prologue is, and it is good. And Zach's here. Zach Argyle says, Dragon I, Fire. I saw his R2-D2 um, commentary. It is sentient, but it just doesn't want to show you, Zach. That's all. <laughs> it just doesn't want to. He's going to grab says the someone, <laughs> Bo says, someone get this man another whiskey. <laughs> he earned I, I need as many whiskeys as I can possibly get. Yeah. Well, uh, if anyone okay. has some uh, some questions, you can toss them out now. Uh, there was some commentary earlier about looking up the Urban Dictionary character name. We're not getting into again. it. We're not, not getting into, into that shit again. It's not happening. We're not getting into it. No. Nope. That was. Uh, if anyone wants to hear more about that, go check out Ryan's live signing that we did uh, uh, last week. Um, it was a it was a shit show, but it was fun. Oh, it was. Yeah. But like. One of those kind of beautiful shit shows. You know, the ones yeah. that you you watch again and again and again. You go, you know, it was a good show, but mm -hmm. it was a shit show. Yeah. yeah. And Shaggy said you it? started it. That's pretty, that's pretty mean. So is your face, Shaggy. Okay. <laughs> um, look at some of the comments here. So actually Joe said, the elf is given the pronoun it versus he or she. Is that intentional? Yeah, no, it's actually very intentional. So um, I use pronouns a lot um, for that exact reason. So there's two instances where I'll do that. So... For elves, I will always do it when there's soldiers from the north looking at elves because the animosity between the two cultures and two races is, is such that they, like, like in any war, when, when the easiest way to kill something or someone is to make them inhuman in your mind. That's why you create monsters with the enemy and why you have the bad guys. So the soldiers in the north will always see elves as it. And what you'll see then is whenever I actually have people from the north and people from the south together, fighting in the same similar conflict the person from the south will always think and refer to elves as he she they whatever pronoun they have whereas people from mm -hmm. the north will always use it because that's what they've grown up with in that that's right. not human that's that's a that's an alien that's you know you know it's it's also them kind of scenario so that's that's always the way they'll look at it and then i always do that with i do that with the dragons as well in that most people will talk about the dragon as it as a beast or a creature mm -hmm. until then they spend time with the dragon. And it's not something I call out in the text, but I will change it. So subtly then you'll see characters such as like Tarman Horde, who's in the second book will refer to Valeris as it the whole time. But by the time you're coming into the third book, Valeris is now he, because mm -hmm. he's understanding that the dragon is intelligent. And I don't make that as a call out thing. It's just a subtle change in the text that he no longer uses those pronouns. Um, and right. so I think that, yeah, that's, that's very much intentional. It's like the developing relationship between the human and the dragon. Yeah, kind of thing. and it, it's, yeah. it's the subtlety of it. Like that, that for me, is something that's important because it shows. It's a, it's a subtle way of showing the development in the character's relationship. Hmm. Yeah, David yeah. Uh, David Walters, friend of the show. No, he's the founder friend of, of the show. Fanatic <laughs> and TV icon. I'm just fucking with him. Some dude. Um, <laughs> some guy. David Walters, aka Hey You in the Bushes. 
Yeah, he's asking a, a personal question. What's your perfect Sunday? Perfect Sunday? Yeah. It's, it's weird because that question kind of half disappears in my head now because I've spent so long working every single Sunday that even like last night I tried to chill out and my brain was like, I know some authors who will appreciate this, my brain was freaking the fuck out and I had no idea what to do and it wouldn't mm. let myself rest. So at the minute, just being able to chill would be a perfect Sunday. But I like the idea of it'd be nice to just chill out, do some reading in the sun, just relax, you know, maybe go down to the beach or something, go to a dinner later on that night. So I'm pretty chill and relaxed right now. I think it mm -hmm. changes, but right now that's what I love. Thanks, Dave. Nice. Uh, is David Walters yeah. or David S. your favorite David? Oh, that's a harsh oh, question, man. That is a very that, David S. isn't even here. You see, yeah, that's bastard. mean. That is mean. <laughs> and you know what? David S. would never ask that question, so I know who asked yep. it. Okay, yep. so it kind of answers itself there, really, doesn't it? Okay, because I prefer whoever isn't being mean. That's why you get demoted to friend of the show and not founder of New York. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you're hey you in the bushes. <laughs> um, Brandon is asking, uh, will the, we be getting another novella before Empires of Empires and Dust to follow the pattern so far? That's definitely the plan. Um, what I'm trying to do at the minute is get myself back to being human again. So like, I'm trying to build a schedule where I take weekends off again, um, which will be lovely. And trying to finish around five or six, because at the minute I was working like 16 hour days, uh, seven days a week. So the plan is to take like two weeks off, um, do a, a few different novella options, do a plan for a full, a bigger plan for the, the rest of the series. And then mm. hopefully I'm going to get a, a novella out now. Not, not too long. Like once I'm recharged and ready to go, I can probably knock a novella out in two weeks. Um, so it just depends. And there's other parts of the process, beta reading and, and that sort of stuff so that that's the plan yeah right on man and uh yeah. oh man so much so much david talk right now david hopkins author of the dryads crown he's saying what about this david right here david uh had some nice things to say about the epic fantasy panel so thank you about that thanks for tuning in thanks for joining us here and uh david walters still loves you but just a little less you know what that is that is fair <laughs> like the reality here is you brought it on yourself. Yeah. And I, I love you both. You know, just right now, you're the one being mean. David S. isn't here to defend himself. It's all ego, you know, That's David. all. Yeah, on, I'm man. telling you that right now. It's, <laughs> no, it's, not, it's not on. It's not on. And we're going to have it. You know, I'm going to call David S. And we're going to have it. We're going to have a panel after this, a private one. We'll talk it all through. Okay? Because that's what we do here. Fat yeah. Fiatic is a family. Okay? Yeah. No fighting. Actually, right now, it's kind of like mom. It's kind of, it's not like dad beating on one of the young kids. Like, stop it, Dave. Jesus Christ. Come on, man. We're about to have better. the same wedding anniversary, man. Now he's just getting Actually, personal. yeah, that was pretty funny. Well, no, <laughs> that no, was really no, it was actually, you know, it was really funny. So uh, Dave was asking me when I was getting married. And I said, I'm getting married on the 27th of June. He said, oh, that's my anniversary. You know, eight years. And I was going, fucking hell. What is with Americans and getting married so young? And he was like, 25 isn't young. And I was like, man, 25, I was running beer pong tournaments in Bolivia. Like, that is, how different a life can that be? It's like, I was getting married, I was running beer pong tournaments in Bolivia. There's... <laughs> well, tell, tell me more uh, about yeah, and these, uh, and these beer pong tournaments. Oh, just I went over traveling, and then one of the times I was in La Paz, and there's like the Wild Rover, and then... Um, What's the other one? Loki Hostels in, in La Paz. And they're kind of all over South America as well. But I went in and we did like, um, there was a beer pong tournament. And uh, we, myself and my friend won it. We went on the first night and then the, like, the owner was like, hey, you want to like work here? Like you get free accommodation and, you know, we'll do some other bits. And uh, all I want you to do is basically my job was come in at like two o'clock, set up some beer pong stuff, help a little bit at the bar and then go over to the beer pong and just play beer pong all night. And help a little bit at the bar and then go back and beer pong. My, my job was basically to keep winning so that people would keep buying beer. Damn. So it was it was really good. I that, know that's a really cushy gig. Yeah. Man, I love that. It was fantastic. <laughs> yeah. oh, really? It was a lot less stressful than this is, although it, it paid a bit worse too. Yeah. You know. But it I is what it is. But you, you know, you, you, come make sacrifices. Along, you come a long way, man. You're getting married in June. Congratulations on that, by the way. And uh, you're gonna share. Mature, though. You're gonna share an anniversary with David. Yeah, you know. 
Yes. That's, uh, now you want to gauge someone's history. maturity. Like you look behind me right now. I got two books, an R two D two, a guitar, two an axe over in the corner, and a whole thing of whiskey. There's a random collection there. Like, and then just to make myself feel like I'm mature, I have an infuser. Yeah. Damn, dude. I know it smells. That's adult. Like peaches that's in here. Yeah. Yeah. It's is great. that to cover? Is that to cover up the smell of sweat when the heat goes? You up? no. Look, you you <laughs> stop. Okay. Just because you're talking the truth doesn't mean anything. Okay. I'm artsy. I have an instrument on the wall. You know what that means, okay? All right. All right, Ryan. Whatever makes you happy. Brandon's asking, have you visited any of the Lord of the Rings sites since being in New Zealand? And if yeah, so, what have yeah. been your favorites? I went to Hobbiton. It was really good fun. Um, and I was actually meant to go to... This is this is the sad part. It, again, there's people worse off. We have crazy flooding uh, in the country right now. And Auckland was got destroyed and this horrible stuff happened. And this was meant to be my first weekend off. Um in over a year after launching the book and Amy had actually booked us to go see Jimmy Carr in the city um, mm -hmm. tonight. And then tomorrow she booked a weather workshop experience where they're going to take us for an hour and a half through weather workshop. And then we're looking at potentially there's an experience where they help you recreate a scene that you want from like, even like your book or your movie and stuff. And they're going to do that. Yeah. And we've had to, we've missed it all. And so oh, man. I was going to do that, but I went to Hobbiton and Hobbiton was amazing. I really loved Hobbiton. Like it's actually a full place now. They built it and they grow all the vegetables there like year round. And then the people nice. who grow them get to take the vegetables home. Um, so it's it's a really cool experience. Man. And actually, we went to a Hobbit hole in the middle of a field. So basically, there's like a farmer who just built his own Hobbit house. And nobody's inside <laughs> it. He just built it in the field. And you have to literally trek through like cow fields. And then just there's the Hobbit the hole. Damn. Not the Hobbit, just the Hobbit hole. I knocked yeah. on the door. There was no Hobbit yeah there's just a farmer who's a really big fan yeah actually in this case there was just cows and cow shit <laughs> that sounds beautiful um it was okay amazing. joe rixman you called of war and ruin a mid-season finale is of empires and dust going to act as a bridge between the first books and the last i kind of see the series as almost being broken into two sections or two arcs and we have kind of completed the first arc so for me like of war and ruin was where you really see like if you go to where the characters end in of war and ruin and look back at where they started like as the author i'm biased but like when i look at where the characters are now i'm actually blown away when i go back to the first book and see where they started and mm -hmm. so for me this was this was the first arc in their journey where they kind of all come to the place that they're they're meant to be they become the they all finally take the initiative to become the characters that they need to be. Um, mm -hmm. And now, and there's been a big journey, loads of development, the whole world is shifting and events happen in a war and ruin that basically changes the fabric of what we're doing. So now these last two books, they, they're not really a bridge, but it's the second act of this series. This is where, this is where shit goes down. <laughs> this is... You know, people say often say that dragons are like WMDs in fantasy, and this is where yeah. we're going to see the WM. This is this is what happens when, for me, um, a nuclear deterrent no longer becomes a nuclear deterrent. When you have nuclear deterrents and then someone just launches one, so Love it. that's the ending of this for me. And yeah, it's it's going to be. I'm really looking forward to writing it. And uh, speaking of shit hitting the fan, Rachel asks, "What were the most difficult scenes, chapters to write in this book?" Um, it depends on what difficult means. So, like, difficult in the idea of like I actually struggled to physically write it because I couldn't think of it. Um, I, I had I had points over this year where I really, really did struggle, like even just mentally, because I was cranking out so much in such a short space of time. Um, mm -hmm. and it just because of the timeline and and the deadline, it was one of those where like I'd come I'd come in and have a shit day. And normally you can go, okay, today's just a, it's just not one of those days. And you step, but I couldn't do that. I couldn't step away because if I stepped away, I'd miss my deadline. So I mm. had to sit here. And some days it took me 16 hours to write the same amount of words that it would take me to write two or three in like two or three hours normally. And I just wow. had to literally, I had no choice. So I just sat there. And I that was it. It was a grind. It was miserable. There was a point for like two months where I didn't enjoy any of it. And then I got back to loving it again, and which was great. But there was mm -hmm. scenes like there was there's one scene which is, isn't one you think would get you, but I actually almost I got quite emotional at it when we were talking about it on a panel in FantasyCon. And um, I was on a panel with Anna Smith Spark and um, Lorraine Wilson and a few others. We were talking about writing the hard emotions. And most people who've read the this book in particular, you'll see 
I make quite a point in drawing up the theme of male mental health and the idea of using foils and using using characters to show what happens when you do and don't have a support network. And I put mm. characters of similar ages and similar circumstances where the responsibility and expectation is thrust on their shoulders. And one has support networks and one doesn't. And one of the hardest scenes for me to write was a really simple scene where um, Kaylin, who's one of the, the lead characters, is is struggling. Um, after, I don't want to put any spoilers in, but he's struggling. And one of the other characters quite simply just asks him, he asks him permission to ask a personal question. And it's from Kaylin's point of view. And he's kind of going like, Jesus, whatever the fuck he's asking permission for, it has to be something mm-hmm. rough. Like, he's in, yeah, okay. And he just asks him if he's okay. Yeah. And and for me, like I got quite emotional on the panel because um, when I was talking about it, it's something that I have a lot of experience with, with friends and stuff. And it's one of those, we just don't realize how that simple, easy question that loads of us avoid asking either because we don't know how to handle it or because we don't want to deal with what comes after. Mm. Um, and those kind of scenes were, were quite hard for me emotionally to write. And like, not hard as in I couldn't write them, but after I wrote them, I was like, fuck me. <laughs> like, I'd say I probably got more emotional writing this book. Like there's so many scenes in this book that touch on really like difficult topics for me. Like, so mm-hmm. yeah, this was a hard book to write from that perspective and in a lot of places, but I think that one for me stood out. That I think that's answers a, a serious uh, answer. Sh- Shaggy's <laughs> question, which was, did you cry while writing sometimes from the emotions you were writing about? Is that a thing? So I think, yeah, you very much. Yeah, I, I never have. Um, but at I least you have. get like, you got like a really emotional at the same time. Or no, really, I, like, I the actually did. It, I yeah. did during this book. So I never have before. And during this book, there was certain moments. Um, some of them just really hard to deal with because I, I'd seen authors talking about it before and I asked the same question. Like, does that actually happen? Like, do you, mm-hmm. like, cause you're coming up with this story. So surely it couldn't. But then <laughs> when I was writing it, I finally, I got it a few times. I was like, fuck, this is like, yeah, I, I, this is actually getting to me. Mm-hmm. And then there was a couple of points where there was even happy moments where there was those characters who got reunited. Well, even I'd been waiting to reunite them. And then when it was happening, I was going, I think I was so in the character's head that I was like, Jesus, imagine what it would feel like to finally get this and to finally feel mm. this. And I was like, oh, Jesus Christ, I need to go and go for a walk or something. This is this is intense. <laughs> like, <whew. laughs> so I must be on a campsite because this is intense. Um, sorry. That's that a was very a... bad. That's a very bad yeah. joke. Yeah. But yeah don't, don't, don't mind that, everyone. Don't mind that one. Yeah. Yeah, I, <laughs> You're I on such a roll, man. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, this is, a, this is a... Two people asking similar question. David okay. is asking, what does life after the uh, the Bound and the Broken look like? And then Shah yeah. is asking, will you continue in the world after you finish the series? Yeah, so it's going to be a bit of both. So I have, I'll, I'll do a little spoiler here. Not really, not for the series. But so I definitely, when I finish the series, I have both stuff planned. So um, it's hard for me to even think past it because it's been everything to me for, for this period of time, like all consuming. Like, you know, a year spending, you know, like I said, 15, 16 hours a day, whether it be writing, marketing, learning, building websites, teaching myself new tech. Like I taught myself to use InDesign the other day and that was grueling. I spent three days trying to learn it. Like, yeah. and it, it's it's crazy, but I do I do have plans to do more in this series. I don't, one thing I never wanted to do was take this story and drag it out longer than it needed to be just because mm-hmm. I wanted to keep earning money off it. So like for me, I have an ending point to this series and these characters story. Like that's, this is their story. Um, but I do have other points that I know I can make full standalone stories from that can be really engaging. And I want to do that. Um, and I do also have plans for other genres, but I kind of always want to tie it. I love fantasy. I love speculative fiction. And um, I think like I've always had the idea of doing kind of like um, a horror fantasy crossover and also like Ooh. a, like a sci fantasy. Um, so I've kind of always wanted to do like um, a crossover where you're going to have, I think I said it before, like, like a zombie apocalypse, but make it vampires and make it medieval third world fantasy. So oh, cool. so the point where you watch the breakout and these fuckers aren't shiny. Like, you know, you watch this and I have the whole scene already in my head and it's something I really want to get into. And then I have another secret project coming up um, that I can't wait to get working on. And it's probably going to take a year and a bit. And it came up with like a little tagline, um, which isn't the anything major but it was it was cool coming up with it. i have a phone here where the concept was 
at the start. I can't remember what it was. Where is it? I'll be here for two hours just uh, scrolling through messages now. But we kind of a little tagline for what this another story would be. And it was literally to protect her people, Queen Arian must steal fire itself. And then that is that's just this little tagline. And it's a whole different world and a whole different story. And there's mm -hmm. a few special things going on with it and um, that I can't talk about at the minute. But that's another thing. So I think we're going to be pretty safe that I don't plan on stopping writing um, mm -hmm. when this is done or ever, really. Well, there you go. So, Ryan's yeah. going to, he's going to keep at it. And uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to do this, buddy. Um, oh, yeah. Man, it's like, we, it's so easy to pass the time with you. I, I fucking love it. Um, like, it's a good thing we have three hours set aside for this. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. I figure it's just, yeah, you know, Ryan didn't sleep much today, so he doesn't need to sleep at all no. tonight. It doesn't matter, but No, I don't sleep. It's not what happens. No. Um, Four to six so... hours is like peak. <laughs> That's not a joke. <laughs> like, I know, man. I know. Six, if, I, if, I, if I set my alarm, it, it, says, it says above five. But it says above five, I'm like, fucking sleeping tonight, bitches. That pains me, man. I have like a yeah. little child, and I, if I was running on five hours, I would not be able to do it. Um, but yeah. Ryan's books are the Bound and the Broken series. So cool. you, can, you can pick all that stuff up. There's The Fall oh. and The Exile, which are novellas. Of Blood and Fire, of Darkness and Light, and of War and Ruin, which is out now in ebook. When do you think things are going to be ready for the physical edition of the new book? That question, it's like, it's, I've never in my entire life, it, it's a really amazing thing, but it's also just really unfortunate because the way this book ended up getting longer because I had the other stories that were coming through it, that the physical edition got, got delayed because I can't start, get the formatting done until the final piece is put in place. So, then the, the wheels are, are late turning. Um, and I have gotten, so never in my life have I done a pre-order for a physical book. Okay. We've done them for like, maybe like a week beforehand for the numbered copies. That's it. Like paperbacks have yeah. never gotten one. Right. And I mean, five or six times a day, emails, Instagram messages. And um, I'll put a post on Facebook about something totally different. And I'll be like, when is the paperback coming out? I have comments <laughs> on the prologue on my website. Be like, when is the paperback coming out? When's the paperback coming out? What's the hardback coming out? And I'm going, Jesus <laughs> Christ, I never knew there was such demand, which is, it's amazing. But it's yeah. like, it'd be more amazing if I had it there. But it should be very, very soon. And um, all the formatting is done. And I'm literally just waiting for the final design to come back so I can take nice. it and upload it. And it's more that the processing time with the printers is the, is the pain because mm -hmm. it's really random. They could have it yeah. ready to go inside a day. It could take four weeks and they will not tell me. So Shit. I have no idea. So the hope is that it's going to be pretty soon. Everything's basically ready to go. Um, yeah. And as soon as it's ready to go out into the world, I'm going to throw it like a sack of stones. That would really all of you can, I couldn't come up with an analogy can, there. <laughs> and all of you can stop fucking bothering Ryan about it and just go pick up the book. But like, it's great though. It's like the nicest, yeah. it's the best feeling. It is, a, so it is cool. a very like, good it's, problem it's, to have. Yeah. Like as in, I'm not sitting here being like fucking... Fucking people wanting my book. Stop how dare you? Me. How dare you? <laughs> it's just more like I wish I had it ready for you is all. Like it's the same thing. Like I said, a lot of the time now I'm yeah. kind of past the point of seeing a bad review and, and getting like, oh, well, how dare you? I'm actually more at the point of shit. Like I let this person down, like especially mm. in later books in the series. Like, that's, that's, that's what it's like for me now. It's like, ah, you know, I really wish everyone could like it because I want it. I want to give you this world and story and hope that you get yeah. lost in it. And obviously I've done something that has, has let that down and it's like crap. And it's, it's not, yes, yeah, it's, it's one of those feelings now. So it's weird. It's the same with the physical books. I'm like, shit, I'm really sorry. Yeah. They're not ready. It's cause you're a sweetheart, man. You know, Aww. you care about, you care about your readers. Yeah. What can Which I say? They're cool yeah. people. Well, if you're patient, you can just go pick up the, the ebook of, of War and Ruin. Uh, which I highly like I wouldn't say no. To check out. And uh, if you want to hear more from Ryan and his shenanigans, he was on episode 16 of SFF Addicts talking about dragons, which was a blast. Or you can go check that out. That was the... so much fun. That was a fun episode, man. You actually get me on a um, load of great panels. And I, really, I need to, you know, <laughs> I really appreciate that. Like, so every time you yeah. message me, it's not like, hey, do you want to come on and talk about like just random shit? It's always like, hey, do you want to talk about dragons and epic fantasy where it's like, yeah. You know, we're going to get Evan Winter. He'll have a chat with you. You know, Ken New will come on and uh, Ronnie Verdi. And like, it's just, it's like, oh yeah, do you know what? Cool. Sure. Whatever. Yeah. These guys are, yeah, you know, they seem pretty, pretty, pretty cool. <laughs> I got your back. That's what it's all about. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, Ryan, thank you again for, for taking the time to do this, buddy. It was great hanging out with you as always. We went like 50 minutes, which is, <laughs> this is, <laughs> this is, is this short, not the normal time. Short. This is short for us. <laughs> 
Um. Yeah, I have a problem, and it's called uh, not being able to shut the fuck up. Um, it's an issue, and my mom has diagnosed it multiple times. She said, "You can't shut yeah. the fuck up." Um, yeah. in, in 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 her Irish accent, which is you know basically that. Fuck off. I, I like hanging out with you and everyone. Mother. Yeah, and everyone uh, threw some good questions in the chat, so I Ooh, really. Appreciate I have one that. thing I have to do. I don't mean to talk across you. Um, Go for it. My cousin Adam. Um, he watches like almost all the interviews and all the panels that I do, um, and it's 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 amazing. And I promised that I would give a shout out to him on the next one I was on, so that when he saw it, he could realize that I'm giving him a shout out. And nice. Adam, hi, hi Adam, and thank you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thanks for watching, and thanks for being Ryan's cousin. And uh... I don't know if we could like honestly, I don't know if that's like, <laughs> something we can like give him credit for. I think it's something that kind yeah. of just happened. He's a cool. He's a cool little dude. Yeah. Like I just, I don't know if, if he is responsible for being my cousin. So I don't know if you can really like be, you know. No, no. Just get into the matter. semantics of it. It's like thank you for existing is what we're saying essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, fair. Uh, and and I'll thank you everyone in the thank you everyone in the chat for for existing and uh, hanging out with us and and giving some good questions and Ryan, thank you for existing and writing these books and and uh, you know closing out this day of TBR con with me because we got one it's day left, man. Pleasure. We got one day I left. Know. Yeah, you get, that's in me. Okay, we're gonna have to do one of these every day. I've made yeah. my mind up now. All right, so me and you every day. Year. We're just gonna fucking shoot <laughs> shit now. And tomorrow we're gonna add on a set, add on another one, and we're just gonna pick a topic and ramble. Yeah, and we'll get Ronnie on. And just, yeah, we'll just go crazy. Yeah, Ronnie can just talk about like bikers and motor oil and whatever can, the fuck. We can else. do the Ryan and Ronnie <laughs> show. The Ryan oh, and Ronnie it. show, and you'll be the moderator in between and telling us both to shut up. Yeah, I love it. Okay, we'll uh, look forward to that in the future, people. The Ryan and Ronnie Back show, yeah. the Ryan and Ronnie where they show. talk about, you know, hobbits and and, and engines, stuff. and stuff, and writing. Oh my perhaps. god, hobbit engines! Hobbit engines, yeah. See, now I have yeah. the picture of Frodo in a pod racer. So, <laughs> calm. Chris says, "Shoot the shit." A new podcast. Yeah, shoot the shit with Ronnie yeah. and Ryan. I like it. All right. Well, that, on that note, we're I've actually just got a tagline. So. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to get the fuck out of here, but thank you everyone for watching. And, uh, I really need to get Ryan off this goddamn show. Can we please leave? <laughs> I got a kid, man. I need to sleep. Whatever. That's always um, your excuse. Yeah, I know, but it's the best excuse. I'm running a convention, man. Just let me rest. Fair. Okay. That's reasonable. Yeah. I suppose. Right. Well, uh, Ryan, love you, man. Thank you so much for doing this. Uh, David thank you for having me. S, you're the best. David Walters friend of the show just deal with it man you know, you're, you go. <laughs> oh they're both I love cool you, i love them i love them both they both know yeah that. you're both amazing uh thank okay. you everyone and have a great night and we'll see you tomorrow for the final day of tbrcon 2023 take it easy thanks for coming guys bye